content creation and social media. Everyone knows it's important and most of us are feeling like, gosh, I am not doing enough. I'm not consistent enough. I'm not posting enough. I spend all this time writing a really articulate blog post or something and nobody cares. It gets three likes on social. What's the point? Uh, if you're feeling like that, come here, Br bring it in. Let me give you a hug because I know how you feel. You want a bigger audience on social media for your school. You want to be seeing fruits from that. More inquiries, more applications submitted, more this, more that. Uh, and it's and it's slow going and you're running out of steam. Well, sit tight because if you put the methods discussed in this episode to use, you're going to see things move in a positive direction. Uh, not immediately, not fast, uh, but if you build a content repurposing habit, results will Come. Hey, welcome to the Higher Ed Storytelling University podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping higher ed Marcom leaders tell better stories, create better content, and enroll more students. My name is John Azzoni. I'm the founder at Unveiled, a video production company working specifically with college marketing teams on automating their video storytelling content through a subscription approach. You can learn more at unveiled.tv. That's U-N-V-E-I-L-D.tv. If you're listening to this podcast for the first time, go ahead and subscribe. And if you've been listening for a while now and haven't left a review, I'd love for you to uh, break the seal and uh, do that. It helps me continue to produce this content by helping others find it in the first place. My guest today is none other than Justin Simon, a growing influencer in the content creation space who has built his whole business around helping organizations just like yours get the most out of their time spent creating content by helping them repurpose that in creative ways that you might not have thought of. We talk about a lot in this episode. We we obviously cover content repurposing, but we also talk about uh, creating great hooks for your content, capturing people's attention, uh, the benefits of podcasting for fueling your content distribution, bunch of stuff. We even talk about Mariah Carey a little bit. So here we go. Uh, my conversation with Justin Simon. All right, Justin Simon, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, John. So your thing is content repurposing. Tell us, tell us kind of what your overall... Um, mantra is or just your your whole your whole thing <laughs> yeah sure i mean at its core i think most companies and even universities or whoever's creating content most people are really good at creating content we've been sort of over the last 10 to 12 years really drilled into all of our heads about content is king and you need content and you got to have storytelling and you got to you know be able to tell a story with your content all those types of that we really understand that and get that but we do a really bad job of actually getting the most out of that content. And so that's really where um, a lot of my uh, stuff comes in at is trying to help companies. Uh, I work a lot with companies right now who are, like I said, really good at creating content. They probably have a couple of good pillars um, of, in terms of what they're doing. Maybe they have a podcast. Maybe they have a, a really productive blog. But they struggle at getting the most out of that content where to distribute it, how to cut it up, how to repurpose it into different formats. Um, and so I'm all about simplicity. And, and uh, a lot of this stemmed from when I worked at a startup and I was went from having, and we can talk a little bit about this at some point, I had a content team of like 10 people at a previous role, went to a startup and I was a content team of one. And so you just learn to become scrappy and try to get as much out of the stuff uh, as you can. So that's really sort of the, um, the genesis of where a lot of that stuff came from. Yeah, absolutely. I, that's why I love the whole topic of content repurposing, repurposing. Cause I'm a content team of one. <laughs> yeah. And I'm always like, a lot of people are, <laughs> what's, what's the, you know, what's the fewest levers I can pull and get the most, you know, return from it. Um, so you tell me about your, so your background is, uh, just tell me about your background with TechSmith and kind of your career and how, how you got to where you are today and starting your company. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, like you mentioned, I used to work at a company called TechSmith, um, worked there for many, many years over, a, over a decade and actually started there as an intern, uh, on the sales team. I knew I didn't want to do sales, but I was like, Hey, this is a good solid company. I'm going to get in here. Um, and they were awesome. Um, you, you don't stay at a company for 10 years unless they're awesome. And I still have great relationships with everybody over there. Um, post pandemic just felt like I wanted to do something different and wanted to try something different. And so went and moved and started working at a company called metadata and ran content marketing for them, 
uh, for just over a year. And then uh, this fall sort of just made the change. You know, I was I was one of the folks who got uh, laid off with a bunch of tech layoffs. And so it was like, okay, I can either go get another job or I can try to just start building my own thing. Threw some stuff out there and had a bunch of people respond and we're like, hey, we need help with this. How do we do this? How, how can you can you come in and like supplement what we're doing? How do and just had a lot of good conversations around that. And so that's basically what I've been doing is building up the business here and working on strategy and working on execution for different teams and just helping people honestly just get more out of the stuff they're creating. And so you're you're pretty active on LinkedIn. I see I see uh, most of your posts. Uh, is that are you <laughs> active on like other um, other channels as well? Yeah, LinkedIn is my main one. That's where I've built probably the the biggest uh, audience at this point. I also have an email newsletter that I send out every single week and and write content for. So I have an audience there. And then as far as the other channel, like I'm like okay at Twitter. Like I'm been trying to like get better at it. But like you said, I think as a one person team, you have to just be choosy in terms of what. Uh, and that's another thing I talk about a lot too in terms of like your actual channels, your distribution channels. And so I've just chosen to focus really on LinkedIn and Twitter for now. I mean, I would love to get on different channels at some point, but right now it's uh, it's it's how how to pick and choose the ones that are going to be most valuable and how I, how I can execute them in a high like high deliverable way. Yeah, that's good. That's that's kind of where I'm at too. Is just choosing choosing something and sticking with it, and just defining a groove and just continuing to kind of dig out that groove, because otherwise it just spreading yourself really thin across all these channels that pop up and new new uh social media things pop up and it's like chasing all of those is just is just stressful so it's like wasn't there one that came out like i forget what it was called but it was a couple of years ago it was like some like audio like you know, like audio thing yeah like you get cl- in, like, clubhouse yeah clubhouse yeah i was just re- thinking about that i'm like what ever happened to that because i was I all stressed went, like i oh. n- i'm proud to say i never <laughs> went into a single clubhouse and in, in my entire life so <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Me either. Yeah. It was like, a, it was like a hangouts sort of what, what, I don't know for just audio or something. You just like audio hang out with people. I don't know. It was, it was weird, but I want to talk about, um, kind of like your, your main driving sort of statement or whatever. I think I got this off your LinkedIn, uh, banner. Most companies hit publish and move on. I help you repurpose and distribute your best content. So expand on that for us. Um, talk about what m- most companies, like the, the idea of most companies hitting publish and moving on. Like what's, what's the problem that you're seeing? Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not only a problem I'm seeing, it's a problem I've experienced. And that's where a lot of this sort of comes off of is traditional content strategies are built around content calendars or publishing calendars, um, with separate sort of thoughts around distribution and what happens after we hit publish on this usually it will get like lobbed over the fence to maybe a social media marketer man or you know a manager or somebody like that or an intern like hey we could just post this new blog go put it on social media for us and that never works <laughs> because the social media manager is isn't tied in with the content or the intern doesn't know the why you did the messaging the way you did it and what the purpose of it is and so My whole drive is to get content marketers who traditionally are more maybe content creators or or writers um, to think about distribution and to think about repurposing their content and how they actually get that in front of the audience. Because over 90% of content that people create will not show up on Google, even though most people probably think when they create content like, Oh, I'll just put a few keywords in there and it'll rank like, oh, or Google, like somebody will maybe view this someday. Um, Or how do we make this post that nobody is really thinking about? Like it's not, it's not a something, it's maybe a thought leadership piece that you want to get out in the world. Nobody's actually thinking about that, but like, how do we, what keywords do we use to make people, you don't use keywords to make people think about that. You have to drive demand around those things and, and get, get attention for it. So my whole thing is, focusing on distribution first and so thinking about in tandem with creation before you even create the thing that you're thinking about how do you plan on getting that in front of your audience i mean the most basic level seo seo would be an easy one search engine optimization so you've got a post that you know is popular and you want to create something for it the distribution for that is google 
And that's a very easy right. one-to-one. -one. That's very traditional sort of marketing. Um, like you can create a piece of content and you can do enough on your end to then fingers crossed, hope Google ranks it and then hope people click on it. But other than that, you have, you have to drive demand for the piece of content that you're creating. So if you're creating a product webinar for a brand new feature that nobody knows about, how are you going to get that in front of your audience? How are, how are you, and then how are you going to communicate that with different audiences? Cause your customers maybe requested that feature. So they might have more, a different take on it than somebody who's never tried your software and doesn't care about that feature necessarily. So it's taking all those things into account before you actually go to create the thing, because that that's what ends up being a bit of a mess for folks is they create it. It might be an awesome piece of content. It sits on their archive. It collects dust. It never gets shared. It never gets used. Everybody internally knows about it, but everybody externally doesn't right. even know it exists. Yeah. Oh, I see, I've seen that a lot. My whole career in, uh, you know, working on, you know, corporate videos and things like that, especially, you know, especially kind of in that corporate world is the distribution is an afterthought. And so we'll spend all this time on a video and then check like maybe a year later on their YouTube and it's gotten like 62 views and we're, and it's kind of a disappointment because it's like, well, what, what was the plan for that? Like, that was a lot of money. You spent, you, that was like per view a lot of money, you know, <laughs> Yep. and, yep. uh, you know, and, and, and a lot of times when I, um, uh, will work with, uh, organizations and we'll talk about, so where is this, how are you going to use this? It's often just kind of like a general tool. Um, and I, that's kind of what I've found is that people use at least video as, uh, kind of like a hammer. Like I want to pay someone to make me a video and I want to just be able to use it in a bunch of different ways. Um, but really it's just going to kind of sit there until someone is like, you know, thinks to use it or something like that. But, but very little, um, working backwards from, from distribution. Um, give, give me an example of working backwards from, from distribution. What, what could that look like for somebody, for a, for a college that maybe has, um, you know, a blog article that they want to write, doesn't have to be video, just, you know, something like that. Yeah. A, a blog article, I think distri working distribution, First, I always suggest, so first and foremost is audience. Make sure you know your audience. Make sure you know your ICP. Make sure you know who you're trying to target because then that will alter channels. But a, a lot of assumption in there, but I'm going to assume you know who your audience is and who you're trying to go after with your content. The first thing I always suggest is channels and narrowing down your channels and deciding where, where that is like we talked about earlier. So in picking one, and starting to get really good at one. So what most people tend to do that I talk to is, well, we'd really like to be on Twitter, but we know YouTube's a thing and maybe even TikTok and Reels and but what about LinkedIn and how do we do, how do we do all those things? And the reality is you can't do all those things. Like or you can't do them all well. Each one is so individualized that how, that you have to focus on each one individually or have somebody on your team who can focus on those things individually. Like you need to have a YouTube expert almost to be able to like do YouTube really, really well and have somebody who's like studying the algorithm, studying the platform, studying what titles really work, what thumbnails are like. That's a whole thing that's totally different than Twitter and how to write threads and how to write hooks that pull people in. That's different than LinkedIn and how to, do, you know, it's each one of these things is so different. So Pick one channel. So you've got your blog, you know you want to write. What channel are you going to distribute that on? And then from there, I like to, once you have your sort of channel set, then you can kind of think through mediums. So let's just use, I mean, I'm active on LinkedIn, but we'll use LinkedIn as an example. So LinkedIn, you can do a bunch of different formats. You can do slide carousels, you can do video, you can do uh, plain text posts, you can do images. So based on that one, article you're writing what are the if you have images that are tied with the text maybe you take that text and tie it with reform maybe you make the image ahead of time because you're thinking about that distribution first you make that image so that it would look good on a social feed you don't just throw some random image in there you think about that ahead of time to say oh i can just instant and then i can instantly re repurpose the same thing i don't have to create two images i don't have to think about it I know I'm going to do an image for this one. I'm going to show off how to do that, but I'm going to format it in a way that makes sense for, for social. And same with your 
how you outline the actual post. When you outline a post, you can basically use your headlines as different subtopics for content that you can post on social media. And so you don't yeah. have to worry about like just throwing a link out and saying, hey, we post a new blog, here's a link. Take the section with the H1 and format that into a standalone piece of content that somebody could consume and learn the information on, on social. That's how I would think about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I think that's that's really good. And one of the one of the best pieces of advice that I got uh, from a social media consultant was 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 at least for LinkedIn. Uh, it's probably relevant for any platform. Is taking big ideas and breaking those into like much smaller posts because people people will in, invest in a in a quick win on social mm-hmm. media. Um, might not you know, want to stick around or not, might not be in a place in their, in their day or in their schedule to stick around for a long teaching on how to tell a story or whatever it is. Um, and that has been transformational for me. Um, because even with this podcast, I'm able to take, uh, you know, each episode I can take like nine or 10, you know, snippets and, and, and break it out and then just link to the full episode. Um, and it just provides quick wins, uh, for, for people. And that's, that's kind of like a whole strategy in itself, way, ways to get, you know, kind of just stretch the content more. And blog blog posts, I imagine, too. Yeah, creating those images that you can get out of blog posts. Yeah, creating, you know, different sub subtopics. But, yeah, really thinking about, um, you know, one piece of content is probably so many more pieces of content. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of, I, heard, I heard somebody talk about it once, like, and this is kind of how I view it, where it's like you see a piece of content and you get like x-ray vision where you can see all the possibilities in it. That's really what I want people to start doing is like to not just see a blog as a blog, but see a blog as the potential to be this, 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 so that you're not having to spend so much time, energy, calories thinking about like, what is the next piece of content we need to create for our audience? when yeah. you, it's it's creation less it's distributing more and then doing that efficiently to where you're also being able to hit the same messages that's a whole other side of this is like being able to be consistent with your messages because so many companies go so sporadic with what they're talking about because they try to produce so much content that they hit their top five and then like well what now what do we talk oh well i guess we can kind of touch on this topic or eh, we'll kind of go over here and it's not like core to who who they're trying to talk to yeah yeah i and i i find that too that you run out of things to talk about um when you're trying to when you're trying to make big statements and that's a stressful place to be to constantly think about you know writing some big monumental thing and having it just be a one thing like one post or whatever and then right. moving on and now you got to think of a whole nother thing it just you know people people just don't have the capacity really to spend they're not like full-time content writers yeah yeah it's it's just thinking about it in a different mind it's just thinking about it with a different mindset in terms of like short-lived campaign mindset kind of like hey we want our we want this message and we want to blast our network with it and we want to like become known for this thing well to become known for something isn't a campaign that's like who you are internally and then doing that consistently over time to where your audience then starts to know like and trust you for a certain thing and i've like seen this firsthand because i didn't talk about like content repurposing and distribution until a year ago but because i did it every day and learned about it and learned the nuances and was doing it myself and figuring out what worked and what didn't and what content was interesting and what content wasn't um, quickly, I mean, much faster than I ever anticipated people like, Oh yeah. Like you're the guy who helps with that stuff. Right. Like you're, you know, a lot. And it's like, well, I haven't been talking about it for that long, (laughs) but I've been doing it for a long time, but I hadn't been talking. So like that consistency of message, I think whether you're a company or whether you're an individual really narrowing down on who you're trying to talk to and then what your topics are and just being consistent with that can can go a long way. A quick break here, speaking of content repurposing, to share with you some thoughts from one of our subscription clients who is the photography and video producer for Baker College here in Michigan. The video subscription idea was a real godsend for me. It's been kind of life-changing in a way. (laughs) I don't know if that's too uh, strong of a statement. There's a lot of content to produce and not a lot of content creators here. So having somebody who can take that portion off my plate, it's it's allowed me a little bit of 
room to breathe and maybe focus on some other projects. Not only do you get a fully edited testimonial, you also get a delivery of all of the B-roll that was taken of that student. For instance, we have this culinary institute. And one of the projects we wanted to do is to create uh, just a short little video connected to a QR code uh, that on all the little chocolates that we, that we give out in the restaurant or if they make chocolates for a special event or for our board members or for any meetings or graduation, they can scan this QR code and up pops this video of some like really beautiful slow-mo hands making chocolate and that sort of thing. And I was able to go into this B-roll and find some fantastic shots of one of our students who did a testimonial creating these bonbons and creating cakes and you've got the batter going and you've got the chocolate drizzling. So I know that I'm going to be able to take that footage, resize it, I can, I can resize it vertically if I need it, I can resize it into a one by one if I need it, uh, I can color grade it however I need to fit my needs. And I really don't have to travel across the state to our culinary institute to do a whole new shoot because I've got that B footage at my hands. So really, that's something that I could sit down, edit for a couple of hours, have it done and check it off the list, which is fantastic. We love internal video teams here at Unveiled because we know what it's like to be in their shoes. We've been there. We've been those people before. It's a lot of work and it's not enough hands on deck to handle all of the content needs for a whole freaking college. Uh, so we're here to make not only the marketing team's lives easier, but the video people's lives easier too and free up their time to be more productive and do other pressing stuff. So head over to our website, unveiled.tv, that's U-N-V-E-I-L-D.tv and uh, book a call with us. And if you're like me and you wanna know how much something costs before you have to talk to a real person, you can go to our pricing page and download our pricing guide, which has obviously pricing and also just like how this whole thing works, FAQs, all that stuff. So go to pricing.unveiled.tv and download that. Okay, back to my conversation with Justin Simon. Yeah, and you talk a lot on LinkedIn about, you know, most people don't see the thing that you posted yesterday or whatever. You totally. Know, and, <laughs> and, totally. I, and I love that. And, and then I see people in the comments going, well, what happens if I'm posting the same thing and the same people are seeing the same message over and over again? And I'm like, well, that that does happen. And for me, like, I think that's me uh, getting your content. I, I, I probably get the same type of thing said in a different way. But for me, I like it because I'm like, it's a reminder that it's a reminder for whatever you're saying that day that fits within your message of repurposing content or, or reposting content or you're know, just staying in front of people. It's just, it's sort of like having a coach in the, you know, in the corner saying, Hey, like, you know, don't, don't forget what we talked about. <laughs> yeah. And people are so worried about, I think alienating an audience or like making them annoyed or making them leave. And, but to be honest, if someone gets annoyed with content re repurposing and distribution and how like air content marketing, like any of those things that I talk about, they're never, ever going to want to work with me in any way, shape or form. So it's yeah. probably OK in my book that they're not actively part of my audience because th the people that need to be in my audience are people that are interested in the things I have to say, the products that I sell and the services that I offer. Same thing for a company. If you if you sell a software that helps people in HR and HR people end up certain HR people don't agree with your mission or don't like what you're talking about, they're never going to buy from you anyway. So it's better for them to not be there. Yeah. And you can bring on new people who believe in your mission and believe in what you're talking about and believe in what you're saying. Yeah. And that's so key to, I think, to define who you are on the on the platform that that you're on. I think that I see a lot of people. There's kind of like two ways. You're, it's sort of like a personal uh, life, you know, sort of like Facebook or whatever. It's like a it's just a personal sort of like document of my life, you know, things, things that are happening, uh, you know. But most people, I, I don't know that like most, most of my Facebook friends aren't like a certain person on Facebook. I guess that's more so like LinkedIn or YouTube or something like that. But, but a lot of people use social media as like, here's this thing I did, um, or here's this job we're hiring for or, or whatever. And, and not thinking it, thinking about it so much as who, what is my personal message, uh, that I want to bring to the world. 
And there's a huge just just saying there's a huge difference between getting likes and getting people to buy your product. <laughs> And so I think that's a, you know, so many times it's dying maybe more now, but like I've been in meetings where it's been, how do we go viral with this? How does this, it's like, you're, yeah. if you're, if you're asking that question, you'll never get there. You're not going viral. You'll never get there. That's not, that's not the purpose. That's not how that, that's not how viral works. Um, you don't right. create no, no viral content was like, this is going to be viral. Um, yeah. I wouldn't imagine anyway, but I think that's something to balance too because you might get five likes but one of those likes is somebody in market and then they go to your website and get a demo versus yeah. one that gets a hundred likes but it was kind of fluffy maybe it was a meme and it didn't really drive any action so it's like trying to find that balance and one thing i think you're, that you're really good at that i'm clued into because i i'm reading this book called hook point by um Brendan Kane. I don't know if you ever uh, heard about it, but it's he he talks about just. I mean, the whole book obviously is like hooking people on, on you know in the digital spaces and how there's so much less focus than there should be on what those opening like three seconds should be or that mm. opening sentence or whatever. And that's one thing I think that um, I've noticed that you're that you're good at is is your your posts always kind of bring me in uh and and like kind of encourage me to keep reading i think you have a good knack like a good knack for like getting me to the next line you know which and so so talk about talk about that like what goes through your mind when you're marketing yourself and hooking people and trying to get them to read your whole message yeah i love that i think um and thank you, by the way, I do try. Uh, but it is, it's one of those things that I, I think regardless of what con, if you're doing a blog post, if you're doing a video, if you, I mean, video in particular, if you're on YouTube, right? Like those first like 10 seconds oh, yeah. are so vital. Yeah. Um, but it's same, like the whole goal of what, think about you as an audience member on these social platforms, you're mindlessly scrolling. You, you're not a searcher. You're not actively looking for anything in particular. You're literally killing time just scrolling with almost no mindset at all and just right. waiting for something to call out to you to say stop and pay attention. And that's the goal of the hook, whether it's an image, whether it's a video, whether it's a thumbnail, whether it's a title, whether it's the first three lines on a LinkedIn post. It's like, oh, like I got I to gotta stop and pay attention. And then like you said, the goal after that is to then get them to read more read each line read the next line and i'm I'm like I, i'd be lying if i said like i really thought through like the format i think i've just written enough at this point like after writing five days a week on linkedin for two years you three years you just kind of get used to like the flow of how you format posts or at least for me um but the whole goal is go from one line to the next 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 like that's like storytelling 101 is really just like bringing people in and then kind of like working them down through and trying to get them to the end point of being like oh okay you know and so and and that's something i'm constantly trying to get better at but i spend way more time on the hook than i do on the actual post absolutely i think people people really need to spend more time on the hook and i actually started um collecting hooks like i have two albums in in uh, two albums in my like photos app on my on my phone uh good hooks and bad hooks and i just ah. as i'm scroll as i'm scrolling and some you know instagram ad is like hey digital marketers or whatever or like they like whip around to like try to get your attention i'll like i'll either you know i'll like analyze it it was like did that get my attention no i'm actually really annoyed like just because you like like came at the camera really fast isn't a, isn't isn't a good hook like you, <laughs> you know and so i'll like screenshot these things and like keep a record of them i think it's really important to do i i really 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 think that in content content marketing the hook is so important and it and it really can define everything that comes after that in terms of engagement because the longer like things like the longer somebody stays on your post is the further that it goes that, that goes for YouTube, um, Instagram, the longer somebody watches your Instagram ad, uh, you know, the, the further it will, you know, share with more people. Um, but if you don't hook them in the first place, if your first line is, hi, I'm so-and-so from such-and-such business, bye, 
You know, yep. <laughs> I don't care. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I think that that's becoming that's becoming even more important when you think about like a YouTube Shorts world where it's sixty second max sixty second max for the video. So your first three seconds have to be captivating, because if they're not, or TikTok or you know any reels, any of these sort of formats where it's just swipe, 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 swipe before you can find something interesting. So it's like though that that first thing to get something in is going to literally make or break everything that comes after it. Totally agree. Especially for colleges marketing to what in the higher ed world we would call traditional students, you know, pe- people coming, uh, kids, you know, kids, I don't know, they're kids to me, coming out of <laughs> out of high school. Um, I'm like the old man, thir- 30, I'm 38, and I'm like, oh, these these youngsters, these they're just kids, they don't know. <laughs> um, I'm 33 and I feel that same way, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I feel less cool by the day. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, so I, but yeah, like for, I, I, I read part of it, I didn't finish the whole book, but it's a, it's a really good book called, um, oh gosh, what's it called? I can't, rem- I can't remember what the actual book is called. I can remember what the subtitle is called, uh, and it's marketing, marketing to Gen Z and, and they, they did the author, you know, did these in-depth studies of people from Gen Z and how they scroll, like literally like went to you know, these young people's houses and, and just watched them on their phones, how they interacted with stuff. And they said, it's like, she said, it's so amazing how fast, um, kids will scroll through like in, and the, and it's been scientifically proven that their brains have actually like evolved to be faster visual processors with this whole iPhone, you know, mm. revolution or whatever. So the fact that, and you know, her, her whole point, I forget the author's name. I'll put it in the show notes. The author, uh, you know, points out that like the hook, the, that hook is, is so important. Like that first three seconds. Cause it's even like down to like the millisecond that, hmm. that these young people are making a decision to watch something or not you know, or listen to something or not. Um, but once you do get their attention, I, I found it in, in a really interesting that they, she said that they will actually go so deep down that rabbit hole um, of learning more and more information. And so one of the things that I've kind of put into place for, for my business is making sure that there is a rabbit hole for people to go down and start to kind of binge content. Like a podcast is a good example, but even just like, you know, posting consistently on whatever social media platform because you know people can go go back through once you've hooked them they can kind of go back through your post and see wow what else is what else is this person talking about and stuff like that but and i and i and i like that advice like you you spend you should spend more time on your on your hook on your headline than (laughs) than anything else so i want to talk about some specific case studies uh one of them i got i think from your linkedin profile was you grew techsmiths uh, organic blog traffic over 25% in the first year while cutting posting frequency in half. But first of all, t- uh, and, and did you, I don't know if you explained what TechSmith was. Um, if people have listened to the podcast for a little bit, they would have uh, listened to Andy, Andy Owens episode who is uh, from TechSmith. But in case they haven't explain to me what TechSmith is and then how you grew uh, that blog traffic. Sure. Yeah. I mean, TechSmith, uh, software company, uh, out of the, the Lansing, Michigan area, um, cr- uh, main products are Snagit and Camtasia, screen capture, screen recording, video editing. Like I said, I worked there for years. And so at a certain point, I had done oh, probably dozens and dozens of different jobs in the um, content space at TechSmith. When you're there for a decade, that kind of happens. And so I started on the website and then moved to blogs. And, and during that transition... I kind of took over a blog that was, we were posting twice a week, but not really with any purpose other than like the average, at that time, it was like the average blog post, you know, post two to six times a week. The more you post, the better you do. Like that was just kind of like gut feel and trend. But we were like killing ourselves to do that. Like we were trying to get like video editors to write blogs about video and trying to get you know, uh, people who made our tutorials to do it. And it was just all like all Mm -hmm. on volunteer standpoint or get, you know, just get different people. We didn't have like, at that point, I'm trying to remember it's been, been several years, but I don't even think we had like dedicated like writers for the blog. It wasn't like we had people who that's what they did was write blog content or do content marketing in that way. 
And so it was like pulling teeth. You were, you were trying to like, they were trying to do an actual job and then write this, and (laughs) and then write this blog post. Right. And so it's like, of course it's, and they don't know SEO. They don't know, you know, any of the other stuff. And so it was like, it was all just this discombobbled thing. And so I started learning more and more about SEO. It's probably 2016. Um, and then just did full like site audits and audits of our content. What was working? What wasn't? And so a whole bunch of nitty gritty in there, but essentially how we got to the point where we were doing less, but doing better was just, um, like efficiencies. So understanding which posts were going to rank the best, do more of those type of posts, get more people in, get more different types of posts. So like more middle funnel type. So I have this problem. How do I make a YouTube video? We've got a blog post that ranks on how to make a YouTube video that links to Camtasia and says, oh, hey, if you want to make a YouTube video here, we have a template, you can use it, da, da, da. So it's like this very quick and easy funnel to get people in to try the product. And so that was the, that's what, that's what we ended up doing was just building in this sort of like high density middle funnel content and then moving people through. It's not like a, an earth shedding strategy, but that's how, that's how we ended up doing it. We were not much more specific in terms of what types of posts we were doing and why we were doing them versus just like, yeah, it sounds like a good topic. I think we I think we could do a blog on that. So any other stories stick out of maybe time where you've uh, worked with someone, they just kind of had some aha moment or really turned their, their content around by repurposing. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, one recently we were just kind of talking about this it's a very similar it's a different angle on it but it's a very similar sort of story where they were doing a live show twice a week for their podcast and you know just started walking through it with them and asking them some questions and drilling into like the whys behind that and you know you just start peeling it's sort of like an onion start peeling away the layers and you just understand like oh like I don't know why we're doing two like we just did and they were successful but they're maybe not as successful now and so how much and then how are you getting that out to your audience how, how much content do you need you know when you talk about like distribution first well linkedin if you're doing if your linkedin's your main channel which it was in these people's case like linkedin only really likes it if you post once a day it's not twitter you don't need to post a hundred times like linkedin really only likes it if you post once a day because that post is going to carry out for several days that's just kind of how the algorithm works it's it's an odd algorithm in that way And so if you post every single day on LinkedIn, that means you need seven pieces of content a week. That's not very many. So can you get seven pieces of differentiated content out of one hour long show where you're interviewing like four people and doing a round table? Probably because you could get one quote from each person and there's four. And so that, you know, so like you just start doing the math and it's like, oh, we cannot be busting our butt to have to do two shows with eight guests every week and manage it and do it like and so just cutting that down, cutting that back, starting distribution first, starting to figure out what you actually want to share on and what you actually need, and then go from there and, and really understand and focus on on what you want to create and how you want to create that. And you're starting a podcast, right? Or you you have a podcast? I, am, I saw yeah. something that was like a waiting list or something. Yeah, the, <laughs> I mean, the, the podcast. So probably, I don't know when this will launch, but it's okay either way. Um, if people want to subscribe, it's going to be out there. It's it's called Distribution First, and it's literally breaking down all of the strategies and frameworks that I use to do this. Um, and sometimes it'll just be me on a monologue, sort of just chatting and giving giving different frameworks. Other times I'm going to kind of invite my friends on and, and chat through how they're doing things as well at different SaaS companies or their own startups and and see see how distribution is working for different companies too. So yeah, Distribution First, uh, if you're interested in this and want to learn more, uh, you can go to distributionfirst.co and that's where the, the podcast will be at. I, I find that the my, this podcast is such a good content engine for, for me. It makes life so easy. And actually, it's the opposite of like my hesitancy to start, start a podcast was was um was because i'm like oh i'm gonna like my you know my job's then gonna become like you know finding guests and like you know coming up with content ideas and things to say and i'm introverted so i'm not great at talking to people (laughs) you know and stuff like that but like i've as i've gotten more comfortable with it it's i'm i just love how easy it it, of having a podcast makes life uh, in terms of breaking that up into smaller 
pieces of content, se- seven pieces of content a week, like you said. Oh yeah, no, I, I think I think every business should have a podcast, but I think most businesses do podcasting wrong. Um, in two ways, they are not co- the podcast is not connected to a core part of the business. So they might use it as a networking thing that, hey, we want to get in with, we're going to interview CEOs because eventually then when they need X, Y, and Z, you know, they'll think of us because we interviewed them one time. Um, But that doesn't really help their audience uh, who is really using the product. The other, the other problem too is a little bit and, and you, it's not wrong. It's just a, it's a, something I've sort of realized as doing working with these type of shows is interview shows tend to get your like you've got me on. So a lot of my thoughts are going to get out in the world on this podcast, but it doesn't get as many of John's thoughts out on the podcast. And so like balancing that out for a show, being able to get your thoughts out into the world and how you see these things and, and using the show to be able to do that. That's what we did when I was at Metadata. We used really two hosts to get thought leadership out there and cut those out um, and then brought on guests sporadically um, and did it that way. Again, there's no necessarily right or wrong. There's tons of tons of really good interview podcasts out there. It's just for me, I think in order to use it in a way that's like a super engine, because part of the fear is you don't know, you can't always lead where the guest is going to go. And so if you've got a bad guest, it's like, dang, that show is just bombed because the guest is bad. Um, whereas if it's just you, you can only blame you, which is a whole other story. Um, but yeah, I've actually got an episode coming up that breaks down. Like if I were starting a content strategy, because I am start, I did start a content strategy in 23, what would I do? And it all stems off the podcast. Everything, like everything I have going forward is going to stem off the podcast. So newsletter, social content, every, like Twitter, LinkedIn, it's all going to stem off that. So if I get the topic right at the top, and I get that right and we have the right conversation or I have the right conversation um, on the show, everything else off of that is going to come off of it. And so the the message stays the same, the content resonates, it all fits. And then I just want to drip that out over the month. So then the same message gets hit in June, even though I recorded it in January. Oh, that's awesome. That's good. Um, let's talk about uh, email content. You have, you said you have a newsletter. How do you get people to sign up for that? Like what's kind of your strategy for opt-ins? My main strategy. So I have two, I have two strategies. I have a, what you would probably call a classic lead gen piece, which is just a distributions or like a repurposing, um, repurposing ideas sort of worksheet that I have. And you can download it on my website. Um, which is basically just taking one idea and breaking that out into, into 30 ideas. And so you can take one idea and get 30 in about 30 minutes if you're doing it right. Uh, so I have that. And then it's honestly just like content and then CTAs within content. So you like, you like this piece of <laughs> this LinkedIn post I had, Hey, I talk about this stuff every Saturday. Uh, if you want to join in and, and, and check out the newsletter, I'm going to give you more in-depth strategies, more in-depth things, give you better playbooks than what I'm just sharing out on LinkedIn. And so that's that's how I've done it. It's very organic. I don't do anything paid. I don't do anything like I'm kind of like slow growing it at this point. But uh, in the be- the best ones too for newsletters are like or any piece of content in terms of like subscribership that I found is like preview posts. So like on Friday, it's, hey, here's a problem. Here's how here's how I think about that problem. Tomorrow I'm breaking this problem down in the newsletter. If you're interested in learning how to do that yourself, subscribe. And so that drives 10x the amount of subscribers that a typical one would. But the oh, key with really that is smart. not the key with that is not doing that every day. Like I'm not at, I'm not I don't have an ask every day. I have an ask once. And so it's like that that balance of like gives versus asks for your audience. So I want to ask you, what, what are some tools that um, people can use to take, you know, some of the manual labor out of content creation, repurposing? Uh, I know you meant you mentioned you use Shield. Um, I've seen on your LinkedIn uh, something about Notion. I don't know what Notion does, but like what what are some how do you how do your tools work together to help you repurpose stuff? Yeah, I'm I'm still trying to figure out my perfect mix. I, I wish there was a tool that could like do like do just what I want. And so now it's a little bit piecemeal and I've tried a bunch of different stuff. I think at the end of the day, it's like honestly my most like my best success comes when I 
have a blog post on one side of the screen and I have a blank Google Doc on the other side that I call a distribution doc. And I fill it out with the headlines of the blog post and I write out my content for those and I say, these are my tweets and these are, and it, you know, some people use spreadsheets. I just like the formatting of a, of a Google post. Like now you can go page list. Notion is very similar. It's just like a Notion's a little bit more advanced, but you know, same thing. You just do a blank page. And then from there, I might use like a tool like Buffer or a scheduling tool to, to go and start scheduling out that content to where my goal is to have like at least two to four weeks of content scheduled and then I'm just good to go. And then I'll let's come in on maybe Sunday night or Monday morning and just refresh and make sure like, okay, do I feel like commenting on this? Is this like still like what I thought was valuable content? And sometimes like, oh, that post stinks. Like I'm just going to ditch it. I don't feel like talking about <laughs> yeah. that today. Um, or you realize, oh, it's a little repetitive. I just had one similar to it. So, but I try to bulk load things. Like I try to bulk write and, and, and I'm in writing mode. I'm going to repurpose like this week's newsletter. I like right before this call, wrote the newsletter and started breaking up that content immediately because the newsletter content was fresh. And so it was like, okay, this content, I'm going to start breaking that down. And I know ahead of time, because I'm thinking about this stuff in a distribution first mindset, I know I need a Twitter thread, I need individual tweets, and I need LinkedIn posts. And so I just start there and I go from there and I say, okay, here's the, okay, what tweets would be good out of this? What what are the solid LinkedIn posts? Okay, I need a little bit more. Okay, I can do a Twitter thread that literally just uses the bulk of the post and formats it in a different way. And then, you know, by the end of the day, I'll have probably 10 pieces of content that can come off of that and ready to be distributed. I do that every week. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I mean, bulk bulk creating is, uh, I, th I think the most stressful way to do content creation is like day by day worrying about what you're going to post. Yep. Um, you know, the, the, the moment I discovered, well, I mean, I always knew that there was social media scheduling, you know, for, for a long time, but when I actually started to use it and I'm like, holy crap, I just, I just scheduled out a month's worth of, of posts. I feel so free, you know, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing. Even with this podcast, like I'll edit the, the show, I'll go for a walk around my neighborhood and just quality control it, make, make sure we're, you know, everything's, there's no random noises or whatever. Um, but then as I'm walking, I'm, I'm writing down like, oh, that's a breakout snippet that's a breakout mm -hmm. one that's a breakout one so by the time i get back to my house i've got like 10 ideas and then i just go cut those all out toss them up i use seemly which um which for me has been really great because it, it kind of takes some of the guesswork out of when to post content and it's, it kind of takes into account when your followers are most active and yeah i, pl I played takes... with that for a little bit yeah it's it's cool I'm, i've been trying a lot of different um uh, scheduling tools and they're all relatively the same, but some have more advantages, uh, mm -hmm. than others. But, but I like, I like seemly so far, just, just for being able to, um, yeah, just, just cue something up, let it figure out when it wants to drip stuff out based on your specific audience and, and, you know, working around posts that are already out there, you know, getting reach, not, not sort of like overstepping and, you know, posting two things at the same time, whatever. And I, I think that's the thing too, is like coming up with, uh, and this is what I'm starting to build out with clients and build out with other folks too, is build, building out a custom framework for you. So your channels, your posting schedule, what do you want? How do you want to do this? And then every week, you know, like my main piece of content is this podcast or is this newsletter or is this blog post? From there, I need to be able to share it on this channel, this channel, this channel. Okay, so Mondays I write, Tuesdays I edit, Wednesdays I cut, we're good to go. And then next week, Mondays I write. Tuesday. So like you try to come up with a, a bit or, you know, record, edit, whatever it is, depending on the type of content, but come up with some sort of schedule to where it becomes regular and becomes a cadence for you and your team, especially if you're a one person marketing team, the better cadences you can be on. Um, like you said, you've got a routine for how you edit your show. You record it, you go on your walk, you do your clips that way. Like you've got it sort of figured out for you what works. Yeah. Selfishly, I'm curious how, how Twitter is working out, uh, for you. Cause I was on Twitter back when it first kind of came out, like 2009, I was working at this big nonprofit, um, uh, doing homeless outreach and we would share a lot of kind of stories and stuff from, you know, people that we were encountering on the streets. And I did a lot of 
posting what I had for lunch that day too, you know, back when that was real cool. <laughs> um, but I haven't been on there in like a decade. And honestly, I've tried to log into my old Twitter account. There's this really dumb like profile picture of me. That's like, if you search my name, it's like me laughing and I have like a faux hawk or something like that. And like, and like big plugs in my ears and, and, and I can't get into my Twitter account to, <laughs> to, to take that down. The old job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the old John. Way cool. I was ten years cooler, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, how how is how's Twitter working out for you? How how do you see that content kind of move through the the digital world uh, in a different way than maybe LinkedIn does? Or I I have not cracked it. I I used to do Twitter massively, so I used to do like r- sports, like NFL writing a decade ago as a hobby. That's what I did. And so I grew like a pretty good following doing that. And I was like on Twitter all the time, like talking sports, doing all that type of stuff. Now I'm making the pivot to like talk about marketing. And there are people who'd like cr- absolutely crush at this. Like, but it like, it it's come comes back to what we talked about at the beginning of the show where it's like, I need to know what the most important things are for me to do now. And Twitter is like, 10th on the list maybe maybe 20th on the list in terms of like important so i'll post but i'm not like actively putting effort into growing that channel in a way even i probably could because it takes time and effort and energy to be on there and respond to other people it's no different with linkedin but like you have to be that that's maybe the overarching probably good thing to end end on too is like you can't just post and ghost anymore like you know, repurpose all the stuff and just post it and then, you know, move on with your life and never interact on those channels. That doesn't work. You have to be able to interact with the people that are on those channels and have conversations and it's social media and it's becoming more and more social media again in terms of like, you can't just post, you can't just expect to get a, you know, bunch of followers or, or, or you know, if you, oh, if I post this really good stuff, like, no, you have to be active, you have to engage and you have to be able to to do that. And I, like, admittedly, I'm not spending time, effort and energy on Twitter right now to grow those, but I see people who absolutely are killing it um, doing that. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of kind of chicken and egg with, with that. Yeah, the only time I'm on Twitter anymore is once a year uh, on uh, New Year's Eve. Um, and it started when <laughs> it started when um, Mariah Carey t- in 2016, like, do you remember this where she was like went on stage and she couldn't sing any of it? She couldn't like remember any of the lyrics to her song. No, I she couldn't hear that. herself. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You got to look it up. It was the best. And I <laughs> feel so honored that I that I witnessed it live me and my, <laughs> me and my not in person, but like on live TV. And it was just the tweets that came out after that were hilarious. It's just so, so, so funny. And, uh, and so now every, every new year's Eve, my wife and I just get on the hashtag, whatever the new year's Eve hashtag is and just watch people just like tear apart (laughs) these people that are just trying their best up there, you know? (laughs) So anyway, uh, Justin, thanks for coming on, man. Where, where, where can, uh, so you do have the, the content repurposing roadmap. Is that, is that like a, a paid thing or, or? Yeah, yeah. So content repurposing roadmap is a course, video course I, I made. It's got 12 videos in it. it. takes you probably, if you were to watch it straight through, right about an hour, maybe a little less, depending if you, you 2x the speed on it. And basically walks you through different frameworks that I use, talks about the distribution documents, shows you how to do that for blog posts, um, walks you through really the mindset shifts that I talked about here on the show. And then gives like concrete examples about how I've done this in past at different companies. And so that that's like very self-service DIY. If you're interested in trying to figure out how to do this, um, that's a great, great resource. And you can just find that at contentrepurposingroadmap.com. Cool. Um, where can people sign up for your newsletter at if they were interested in that? Yeah. If you want to sign up for the newsletter, you can go to justinsimon.co. And there'll be a little newsletter tab right at the top. You can sign up there and those drop every single Saturday morning at 8.15 uh, every every single week. So, yeah, definitely uh, would be happy to have folks uh, join me over there. 
Awesome. Well, it's great having you. Thanks. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me, John. It was fun. Fun combo. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Justin, and I mentioned a book in, uh, about marketing to Gen Z in this episode, and it's called Instabrain. I recommend checking that out. Link in the show notes to where you can get that. Also a link to where you can get the book Hook Point that I mentioned by Brendan Kane. Three things I want to give you before you go. Number one, if having a lot of student and alumni success stories uh, at your disposal is something you would love to have, if you could just snap your fingers and have what you want, let's talk. I've got something great for you with our video storytelling subscriptions. Uh, imagine having one new student or alumni story drop in your inbox every month plus 10 other supplemental videos stemming from that story 11 videos per month that's 132 pieces of video content per year plus all of that footage to use as you wish forever no extra charge for more information on that including pricing go to pricing.unveiled.tv and download our pricing guide Number two, if you want to take the storytelling you're already doing to the next level, I have a free resource for you. It's a three-part framework for creating compelling student and alumni testimonials. Get it at unveiled.tv slash student testimonials. doesn't even have to be for video. It works for uh, written content as well, or telling stories on stage, or in a presentation, your next TED Talk, whatever. So go pick that up. Number three, leave a review for this podcast. It helps us out a ton. Thanks so much for listening. My name is John Azoni. Go connect with me on LinkedIn or email me at john, J-O-H-N, at unveiled.tv. TV. And in the meantime, we'll catch you on the next episode of the Higher Ed Storytelling University podcast. Thanks. Thanks.